Hello, my name is Ivor and I'm a senior fellow in emergency medicine and medical simulation at Calderdale and Huddersfield NHS Foundation Trust in the UK. In this lecture, I will talk to you about intraosseous access, which will surely be useful in your daily clinical practice, because I'm certain that on many occasions you have encountered difficulties with peripheral venous access. This is especially common in emergencies when gaining IV access can be extremely hard and frustrating. I think that Dr. Orlovsky illustrated this situation best when he entitled his review article about IV access, My Kingdom for an Intravenous Line. Of course, referring to Shakespeare's famous play Richard III, who in battle shouted, My Kingdom for a Horse. Dr. Orlovsky was one of the key physicians who in the 80s and 90s rediscovered intraosseous access and significantly contributed to popularity it enjoys today. IO access was heavily used um, during the Second World War when IO needles were included in emergency medical supply kits but was very much forgotten in the subsequent years in part due to advent of modern IV catheters. From personal experience we know that failed IV attempts are common and research clearly confirms this. It has been shown that even in ideal conditions we are not 100% successful during our first attempt at IV access. Furthermore, we know that subsequent attempts have even a higher failure rate, which of course becomes a big problem in emergencies. Let's now take a look at some of the factors contributing to failed IV access. Patient characteristics are very important, for example age, both of its extremes. Children have their own distinctive anatomical and physiological features, but problems can arise also from our poor technique or inexperience with this patient population. Of course, both children and adults can be in shock, which leads to collapse of peripheral veins, making them difficult to palpate. Furthermore, there are patients with damaged vessels, such as IV uh, drug users, or we might be working in conditions that are far from ideal, such as in the back of an ambulance or in various out-of-hospital environments. There are many more factors that make IV access difficult, prolonged, or even sometimes simply impossible. So what can we do if peripheral cannulation fails? Well, there are basically three alternatives. Central venous access, surgical venous cut down, and intraosseous access. Let's compare uh, features of these three procedures. In the header of the table, you can see uh, that we will be comparing three central venous access sites with venous, venous cut down and intraosseous access. We will be comparing them on features that are important in emergencies. First of all, we can see that based on access in emergency, intraosseous access has the highest marks. The reason being speed. It is much faster to obtain uh, than the others. IO access also shines in terms of experience. This technique can be taught qu very quickly and performed by various groups of medical practitioners in a safe manner. Infections and other complications are extremely rare with IO access. Its short-term use is excellent, while it is not applicable for long-term use, which is anyway not important in an emergency, because the whole point of IO access is to act as a bridge for more definitive intravascular access, which can be gained once the patient is resuscitated. Results in this table are based on scientific evidence, which is also acknowledged by respectable medical societies uh, like the European uh, Resuscitation Council, which placed a great emphasis on IO access in their 2010 resuscitation guidelines. In uh, pediatric uh, resuscitation, they recommend insertion of an IO needle if attempts at establishing IV access are unsuccessful after one minute. In resuscitation of adults, they say that IO access should be considered if IV access cannot be established within the first two minutes. Similar recommendations apply in trauma. European Trauma Course, which is developed by four organizations including European Resuscitation Carlson and European Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery, teaches that venous access is a high priority in the child with severe injuries and if it is difficult to obtain, the intraosseous route is the preferred next step. Now that we have determined that IO access is useful and highly recommended, let's take a closer look at what it actually is. If we take tibia for an example, 
we can see that this is a long bone comprised uh, of an outer layer of hard compact bone and a central space of spongy bone which is rich in bone marrow and extremely well perfused. This area of bone can be viewed as a vein that never collapses, meaning it is available even in the state of shock. Furthermore, it is very well perfused and has excellent connections to systemic circulation. For these reasons, we can say that IO access is equivalent to IV access in terms of functionality and drug delivery. There is a common misconception that this is not true, but several key facts confirm it. First of all, all the therapy that we normally use through IV route in an emergency, we can also use through IO route. All the commonly used emergency drugs, fluids and blood products can be used in the same dose and in the same way. For a summary of available clinical data about IO medication dosing in adult and pediatric patients, please uh, consult the following review article. Second common myth is that IO route is slow, that it takes a long time for drugs to reach systemic circulation. This is again not true since research has shown that if IO route is used appropriately, it is as fast as IV route, even approaching speeds of central venous access. These video recordings in which a contrast is applied to humerus and tibia will confirm how quickly drugs reach systemic circulation. On the humerus example, on the left, left side, you will see the contrast reaching the right heart ventricle in a matter of seconds. I'm going to play the video now. You can see how the contrast passes through the humerus, and there it is, now reaching the right ventricle. The same applies for tibia, with the contrast reaching the popliteal vein very rapidly. I'm playing the video now. So when will we reach for an IO device? Of course, we will not reach for it immediately in every patient that needs IV access, nor it will be our uh, go-to modality after a failed first attempt at peripheral venous cannulation in every patient. We should consider IO access in every patient in whom IV access cannot be gained rapidly in the presence of shock, cardiac arrest, respiratory distress uh, with the need to secure the airway following an RSI procedure, status epilepticus, presence of other factors such as burns, or mass casualty events where it is certainly easier and faster to place a large number of IO needles than for example central veins. Among other things this is the reason why IO access was always very popular in the military. But what are the contraindications for IO access? Well, they can be divided into absolute and relative. IO access is absolutely contraindicated if there is a fracture in the bone. For example, in the case of a fracture in the left tibia, you will choose the right tibia instead or another bone. Some authors claim that you are not allowed to insert IO needle in a bone even when there is a proximal fracture. For example, they say you should avoid tibia in the case of a femur fracture. On the contrary, others say this is not important since the circulation systems of these two bones are separate. I think it's worth being cautious and choose another site if it is available. As in the case of a fracture, you should also not attempt um, IO access in the bone with previous IO attempts, like regardless if they were successful or not. In both of these cases of a fracture and previous attempts, there is a breach in the bone and if you start administrating fluids and drugs in such a bone, you would risk extravasation, which can have serious consequences in the form of a compartment syndrome, which can potentially lead to the loss of the extremity. Among relative contraindications, we can list previous orthopedic uh, surgery, uh, of course, because you will not be able to, for example, penetrate an implant made of titanium. Infection at access site is another relative contraindication that can lead to osteomyelitis or sepsis. If the bone is weak for any reason, then it will, not, then it will easily break and will not provide enough support for the needle. On the other hand, if it is too hard, you will not be able to penetrate the bone. 
One of the common misconceptions that scares many is osteomyelitis. Many believe that the act of penetrating the, uh, the bone alone uh, is enough to guarantee this complication. However, that is far from the truth. It has been reported that infections with IO access appear only in 0.6% of the cases, among which cellulitis is by far the commonest infection. Additionally, it's worth mentioning that since 1985 until today, there were only five cases of osteomyelitis reported in the literature due to IO access. To conclude, if IO access is obtained following safe procedures, there's really no reason to fear complications. We will now take a look at the selection of insertion sites. There's some differences between children and adults. For example, sternum is not used in children because of possible penetration and injury to the heart and big vessels, but it is used in adults. Pelvis is rarely used in both children and adults, but distal femur, on the other hand, is used in children but not adults. The reason is, um, it is rarely used in adults is because of a lot of tissue above the bone that makes identifying the insertion site uh, difficult, as well as the needle penetration quite challenging. By far most often used site in both children and adults is proximal tibia, followed by humerus and distal tibia. We will describe these three sites in more detail. As we mentioned, proximal tibia is the preferred insertion site uh, for several reasons. First of all, there is not much tissue above the bone, which makes insertion site identification easy. Furthermore, the insertion site is big and the underlying bone has excellent blood supply. Additional benefit is that this site is far away from patient's head and chest, which is especially beneficial during CPR, because there are rescuers already around those body parts performing important tasks like airway management and chest compressions. Site of insertion can be easily identified if external rotation of the leg is applied with slight flexion of the knee. To support the leg, a roll towel or a similar object can be placed below the knee. Now we need to identify the patella, its inferior border, and uh, continue distally to identify the tibial tuberosity, a bony thickness below the patella. Sometimes in children you are not able to identify the tibial tuberosity and in that case you will use the patella as orientation point. From tibial tuberosity move 1 to 2 finger widths or about 1 to 3 centimeters medially and distally. Here lies your insertion site, the anteromedial flat surface of the bone. Let's take a look at the video again. So we identify the patella Below it, we identify the tub tuberosity and we move distally and medially to identify our flat insertion surface. Below it is metaphysis of tibia, which is very well perfused and has a tiny layer of cortical bone. Some authors suggest that once you have identified this flat surface on the tibia in children, you move slightly more distally in order not to insert the needle into the growth plate while in adults you can move slightly more proximally because the more distally you go, the cortical bone gets thicker. Let's move on to distal tibia, which represents a desirable insertion site, especially in older children and adults, because the cortical bone here is much thinner compared to proximal tibia, therefore easier to penetrate. Especially in case you only have a standard IO, IO needle, you have to insert manually without any assistance. To identify the insertion point, again start with external rotation of the leg and flexion of the knee. Find the medial malleolus and its superior border from which you move 1 to 3 cm upwards. Here lies another flat surface of the tibia. Finally, we will take a closer look at the humerus. In order to find the insertion site, the correct arm position is vital. Any movement of the arm will translate into movement of the insertion point. So you need to place the arm in the correct position. First, adduct the arm and flex the elbow and place the patient's palm on their belly button. Now that the arm is in the correct position, start palpating the humerus in the middle between the muscles moving upwards to the greater tubercle, which represents the insertion point. 
It can be quite challenging to identify the assertion point, especially in muscular patients, so firm pressure must be applied. After the insertion site has been identified, we can now move on to needle insertion. Of course, we will need an I.O. device, and they can be divided into manual and assisted devices. There is a variety of manual needles, usually named after their inventors, that rely solely on you and the power of your muscles to penetrate the bone. On the other side, power-assisted devices, which are responsible for popularization of I.O. access, will facilitate this process for you. As you can see, there are three assisted devices shown on the slide. The fast device is used to access the sternum and will not be described in this lecture. But the other two, big and easy I.O., will be demonstrated later on. Before we focus our attention on the assisted devices, we will go through the standard procedure of gaining I.O. access with a manual I.O. needle. The preparation and procedure is the same for assisted devices obviously apart from the insertion itself. After we have identified our insertion site, we need to clean the skin with an antiseptic agent like chlorhexidine or iodine. If the patient is conscious, after we explain the procedure to them, we need to think about using local anesthesia. Patients might experience somatic pain as the needle penetrates tissue and bone. This somewhat depends on the speed of insertion and is usually somewhere at the level of pain associated with I.O. cannulation if you are using one of the assisted devices. However, with the use of manual needles, pain can be more severe. Local anesthesia can be achieved with lidocaine, making sure that it is generously applied all the way down to the periosteum. We are now ready to insert an I.O. needle. Manual needles are rarely used today, however we will show you quickly how to introduce one such needle. Uh, we will use a cook needle as an example and following all the steps of the procedure we will focus more on modern assisted devices. Before inserting the needle which we will show on this model, you can use your non-dominant hand to stabilize the patient's leg. Some movement is always possible. Be careful that you don't place your hand directly below the insertion site because if the needle penetrates the whole width of the bone, you might injure yourself. Holding the needle in your dominant hand, place it at 90 degrees angle to the bone surface. Do not push straight down but introduce the needle with a drilling motion, just like you can see in the video. In newborns, the needle should be aimed in slightly posterior and inferior direction to avoid damaging the growth plate. Continue introducing the needle until loss of resistance is felt, signifying that you have perforated the cortical bone. Remember, your goal is not to advance the whole length of the needle into the bone. After you feel the loss of resistance, introduce the needle for another half a centimeter at the most. After we have inserted the needle, we must confirm that it is in the right position, just as we would do after gaining IV access. First indication that insertion was successful comes in the form of loss of resistance felt during penetration of the cortical bone. Second good sign would be if the needle is standing up on its own. Furthermore, there is aspiration of bone marrow. Although it is worth mentioning that you will not always be able to aspirate bone marrow, this can mainly happen in low cardiac elbow states such as cardiac arrest. Final confirmation comes if there is no tissue swelling after administration of fluids and if medication given via IO root shows effect. Now that we are sure that the needle is in the correct place, we need to secure it. This can be done with some tape or commercial dressings. Materials you use must be transparent because you must be able to see the tissue around the insertion site so you can promptly notice any signs of extravasation. It is good practice to write down the exact time when IO access was gained and this can also be done on the dressing. Another good tip is not to connect the syringe directly to the needle because in that way you can easily dislodge it but to use extension tubing. Before you start any fluids, think about sending bone marrow samples for laboratory tests. You can get a lot of valuable results from this sample, but please remember to properly label it as um, IO sample. 
After wasting 2 ml of the marrow and blood mixture, the following tests from marrow samples correlate very well with blood samples. So you can see hemoglobin and hematocrit, urea and creatinine, glucose, blood cultures, type and cross, medication, drug levels, electrolytes, while blood gases uh, are somewhere between ABG and VBG. Intraosseous samples can block conventional laboratory equipment. So I again emphasize it is very important that you correctly label them before sending them to the lab. Some point of care analyzers like ISTAT are able to process intraosseous samples safely, but some on the other hand are not. So be familiar with the equipment you plan to use to process IO samples. It is important to say that you need to take the bone marrow sample in the very beginning when IO access is obtained because results are no longer reliable after administration of fluids or medication. Also, full blood count does not correlate well with the blood sample. Before starting fluids and medication, you can consider anesthesia again. However, this time because of visceral pain that can occur because of raised pressures inside the bone. This is more pronounced in children and very severe pain can spread all over the extremity. To prevent it, we can anesthetize the inside of the bone with lidocaine and the doses are shown on the slide. For adults and children above 12 years of age, you can use 20 to 40 mg of lidocaine as an initial dose. This translates to 2 to 4 ml of 1% solution or 1 to 2 ml of 2% solution. Things are a bit more complicated for children below 40 kg, where the appropriate dose is 0.5 mg per kilogram. To avoid calculation errors in an emergency, it is advisable to have readily available aids with pre-calculated dosages expressed in volume of lidocaine based on patient's weight. A subsequent dose of lidocaine can be given, which is usually half of the initial one. It is important to emphasize that lidocaine should be given slowly because we want it to unleash its effect locally inside the bone and not flush it so it ends up in systemic circulation. It is also advisable to allow some time for the drug to start having effect. Of course, this step is not obligatory in unconscious patients. However, what is obligatory is performing a syringe flush. IO space is full of coagulable fibrin mesh and thick bone marrow, so without flushing, you will not be able to achieve adequate flow. Flushing is performed with a bolus of normal saline and can be repeated during treatment at regular intervals on when flow starts to decrease. We are now ready to start administrating fluids and drugs. It is important to know that without additional pressure, we will not be able to achieve flow of fluid comparable to IV access. Pressure exists inside IO space that we need to overcome in order to get the fluids flowing. This pressure is approximately one third of systemic mean pressure. Just with gravity, so getting the bag of fluids up in the air will give us a maximum of uh, around 50 ml per minute. However, if pressure is applied, we can get up to 300 ml per minute. In children, uh, the simplest and easiest way to achieve this is with syringes and infusion pump and pressure cuffs. Also, do not forget to follow each medication administration with a 3 to 5 ml of fluid flush. These are all small details that make a difference uh, between successful and unsuccessful IO access. Procedure to remove the IO needle is very simple. Most manufacturers recommend that needles should be removed during the first 24 hours. However, there is a lot of literature describing their use during a period of several weeks without any complications. Nevertheless, in normal circumstances, your goal is to replace the IO access with another more permanent solution after successful initial resuscitation. The same as with insertion, uh, when you're taking out the IO needle, you will not pull it out straight up, but again use circular motion. One useful tip is to attach the syringe um, to the needle and then rotate them together while gently pulling upwards. Inspect the needle after removal to ensure it is intact. 
After needle removal, it is enough to put a simple dressing or a band-aid over the insertion site. Let's now summarize all the steps of IO access. Steps colored in light gray are not obligatory. First, we identify the insertion site and clean it. We administer local anesthesia if we expect pain on insertion. After that, we insert the needle and confirm its position. Potentially, we obtain bone marrow samples and administer local anesthetic inside the bone. Finally, we flush the IO needle and start administering fluids and medication under pressure. If you're using an assisted IO device, all the previous described steps are still the same, except, of course, uh, the introduction of the needle. I will now quickly demonstrate how these two devices, Easy IO and Big, help you with needle insertion. Easy IO, or sometimes called the drill, is a battery powered device that offers great speed and precision during IO insertion. It can be used in both adults and children, and here you can see the approved insertion sites. The device uses three single-use needles of different sizes. All needles are 15 gauge in diameter, but of different length. Needles are roughly divided based on patient's weight, but actually the more precise measure is overlying tissue. You see needles have horizontal black lines on them, and once the needle is pushed through soft tissue to the bone, at least one black line needs to be visible for it to be able to reach IO space. We will now see a short video of how to use Easy IO. Needles come in a needle pack with some very useful accessories. Like for example, you will find a sharp container there. The needle itself attaches to the drill by a magnet. To insert it, you first need to push it through the skin until it touches the bone without squeezing the trigger. Once it touches the bone, then you squeeze the trigger and you, need, you use moderate downward pressure and let the easy I.O. do all the work. When sudden give is felt, you release the trigger and then you disconnect the drill and remove the stylet. The second device I will demonstrate is called BIG, which is short for Bone Injection Gun. It is a single-use, spring-loaded I.O. device and it is approved for use in proximal tibia and proximal humerus. Big comes in two sizes, adult with 15 gauge needle and pediatric with 18 gauge needle. Big has a spring which when released propels the needle into the bone with a predetermined force and to a specific depth. Based on age, pediatric big is adjusted to propel the needle to a specific depth. In the following video, you will see a demonstration of BIG in use. I apologize for the angle of the video. The device is held with a non-dominant hand perpendicular to the insertion site. Safety latch is removed. And then with dominant hand, the device is pressed firmly to release the needle. Once the de device has deployed and entered the bone, the trocar is removed and needle secured with a safety latch. You can see the same procedure on these photos. This was a short demonstration of various um, devices for IO access. Please familiarize yourself with the devices they, that are available to you and attend workshops on models before you use them in clinical settings. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and will strongly consider adding IO access to your competencies so that your patients will fail IV access will not look like this poor chap. Thank you.